Greetings and welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rasta. Now, following on World Soil Day, we expanded the conversation a little bit with lecturer of sustainable land and water management and disaster risk resilience, Dr. Ronald Rupnarai. Dr. Rupna Ryan, thank you for joining us. How are you? I am fine. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you. Now, I, like I said, we started the in, initial overture was with regard to World Soil Day. So I still want to get some of that, that those topics in. But one thing I want to start on, please. Diversity of soils in Trinidad and Tobago. Different areas, you get different type of soil. People know that the soil in Paramin is a certain type of way. The soil in Central, where they're making a lot of deals, is another type of way. So what do you say on the diversity of soil in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, the Trinidad is one of the mo most diverse uh, in terms of soils in the entire Caribbean, if not the most. We have 123 different soil series. And a series is a group of soils with similar characteristics. What that means is that within a series, you can also have variation. So <clears throat> the issue is, I mean, it creates a lot of problems for both uh, infrastructural development as well as agriculture in terms of fertility. Because in one plot of land, maybe say in an acre of land, you can have multiple soil types. So therefore, whatever foundation you're putting, on, putting in has to cater for that in order for it to be properly you know, resilient to all the effects of the different um, physical and chemical properties of the soil. And further to that, from an agricultural perspective, it's probably even worse because you see <clears throat> on a continent, in continents where they have large uh, expanses of land that they could have employ the same management technique, you know, the same application of fertilizer, the same application of water, etc. And it works fine. In Trinidad, it's different because of the diversity of the soils. So in one patch, you may be doing X, Y, and Z. I may be working fine, but in the same uh, district where persons are planting the same crops, the management techniques have to be adjusted to suit the soil types. And that creates a big problem in terms of productivity and, you know, consistency of quality and quantity of produce. And thanks for touching on that, because that's one of the things I wanted to ask about. And is there a distinction between Trinidad and Tobago with regard to those series? Yes, Trinidad and Tobago has... Uh, well, let me explain how it's done. So a series, people might speak about different soil types and you might hear the local terms zapate and that kind of thing. So a series are actually named based on where they were first uh, defined or formed, right? So you could have things in like our soil series examples are the Princess Town soil series, the St. Augustine soil series, Piaco soil series. However, there is this misconception that if something is called the Piaco series, it can only be found in Piaco. And that's not the case. It could be found in many other districts, you know, that have <clears throat> similar soil formation factors. So you could find Princess Town in Tableland, for instance. Yeah. Now, in terms of that Tobago, Tobago, uh, the soils are diverse as well, but not as diverse as Trinidad. Yeah. Trinidad has critical issues with respect to what we call expansive clays, what in, in local colloquial terms would be referred to as zapate, the zapate mud. And those expansive clays creates lots of issues in terms of structural stability, the infrastructure, in terms of works that we uh, roads that we are seeing now. Much of that is really because of the nature of the soils in these regions. So South and Central Trinidad is dominated by expansive clays. And that actually even leads to some people saying, but we have pitch, we have this, why the road looking so? But in, even before we speak about road networks and stuff, uh, what does that mean for building in terms like house structures? How far apart do you find these series? So if we say, you're saying you can find different series in different areas, but is it something that can be so acute that at the front of someone's uh, premises, you can find one type that would cause call for certain types of building practices. And at the back of the house, just a, just a stone's throw, there's a different type, which would call for something a little different. Yeah, that is very, very possible, particular, particularly based on where it is, 
So you have like South and Central, as I mentioned, is dom dominated by expansive clays. But the distinction in terms of the boundaries of these series, you could have, they could be very close. So there is a possibility in an acre plot of land, or even in a, in a lot of land, you can have two soil series. Now they wouldn't be, now that being said, they wouldn't be distinctly different eh? to the point where it's very, very different that you have to employ totally different um, construction work because obviously they will be in the same area so you expect them to have similar formation factors. But there could be slight differences and particularly when you're looking at large-scale construction that covers a wide area, these are things that you need to put in place. And I'm saying that because if you take a, a, a look at the housing developments that have been, you know, constructed in the last couple of years, maybe last decade, there are quite a few issues with in terms of stability. Houses have been showing cracking. There has been landslips. They have been moving. There was a case like that in Orokuch. Las Alturas is another case of stability issues. So, you know, it's something that we don't really pay much attention to. So soil science is a critical part of construction when you look at stability and soil mechanics. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, uh, Dr. Rupnarain, um, the is it a matter of saying, okay, well, for these big projects, or let me ask that differently, how many soil scientists are there locally? And I ask the question because it, to me, it would make sense, okay, if we're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of resources doing something like this that has implications for so many families, uh, whatever, um, it would make sense to have a soil scientist on board in terms of working on those feasibility studies, saying, okay, well, these are some of the things they may have to look out for. So how many how many of your ilk, are, or your colleagues are there here locally? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky subject, and I'll tell you why. So civil engineers would have to do some level of soil science and soil mechanics uh, in terms of understanding foundations, et cetera. But it is not sufficient, in my mind, to fully understand the nature of the soil. So in terms of actual soil scientists, well, it depends on where you want to make the distinction between, uh, well, as a soil scientist, whether it's at the PhD level or as a master's level, in terms of academic academic qualifications. However, it is, however, it, it works functionally, because there are some people who have a piece of paper, but what it is they're able to do practically, practically hmm. Technically speaking, they are only... I would say four soil scientists or five soil scientists in the entire region, four of which are at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. No man only. And soil science can be broken down as, 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 as for, just for the benefit of our viewing audience, audience into soil chemistry, soil physics, and you could have like soil biology or a more, you know, biological approach to it. So physics is where the mechanics come in, right? So you understand the movement of water, which as you can clearly see, we didn't quite understand why this employ these techniques because you're seeing that the, most of what is happening in Manzalina has to do with, with that, with water passing through soil. The same issue up is, is what is was happening in Orupuch. And this leads me to a question if we're talking about Manzanilla, what recently took place and we, we've recently been experiencing around the country. Um, where does institutional knowledge play a part? I say that because there may be someone who comes from an area from outside of where that project is going to take place. Do they consult with individuals? And I say that because if water is going to be passing this way and that way, you have fresh on one side, salt on one side. Is it a matter of saying, okay, we're going to build something that just runs along a certain height, or we create a channel for there to be passage of water so that water will find this level, the easiest way to flow out and possibly flow in, so you're able to do it like that. Uh, so institutional knowledge, um, trying to get all the, the sides of the story and information that there, that there is before you move forward. How does that come into play or where should that come into play? Uh, you see, that's uh, when you say institutional knowledge, are you referring to the persons in the area, like indigenous knowledge to the community? Yeah, I'm I in the area and I know that when this, area, when this is happening, water from the mang or from this area comes out and it meets the sea. So that if you if you if you're going if you're going to put a road there, there may be some issues. Right. 
So that's where there needs to be what we call the participatory approach to any sort of intervention. People who live there, they may not know the technical terms and all the, 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 the um, mathematical figures to show the equations and all of that. But they will very well be able to explain to you what has been happening since they have been there. So it's very, very, very important to consult with these people to understand that cross-reference that with the scientific evidence. And to be quite frank, we're in an age now where you could be basically map out where water is going to go based on elevation and other techniques that they are, they are hydrological modeling and so on. So none of these things are a mystery. You know what I mean? And there are other countries that if you visit, uh, yeah, Colombia, for instance, in Cartagena, over the entire mangrove, because they didn't want to create the same issues that we have here, they built their roads uh, on stilts. So they're elevated above the mangroves. The mangrove still exists wherever they need to be. There's no interruption in the water flow and that sort of thing. But of course, you need ex you know, a large amount of funds to do that kind of construction for a lengthy road. However, if you could identify the areas where the mang is you know, offloading its water currently, you could probably do it in in stages so you don't have to do it for the entire stretch but you do it for the areas where the water you don't want to disrupt it it's flowing out here you build a bridge all right and we continue the conversation that because in terms of like getting soil information and data that is started on i want us to i don't want to kind of just lump that into a little bit here and then say okay we're going to break so we go to the break now and we return on that point stay with us we come back with more <music> Welcome back. We are having a wonderful conversation with Dr. Ronald Rupnarain. So yes, World Soil Day was the jump off point and the original premise, but we're also looking at the sustainable land and water management, disaster risk resilience. And one of the things that we were speaking about just before we went to the break, Dr. Rupnarain, is one, getting information about from different places to have the best product that is fit for purpose, but also how do you get that soil information where is it stored how do people access it so that the work that has already been done can be utilized well as for most people may not be aware the general viewing public but the soils of trinidad has been documented there is a digitized map in terms of accessibility there is some data sharing issues in terms of us having a data sharing policy where you know, the public can actually go out and, you know, go to a website and access all that information, which is what happens in like, you know, US and UK and so on. You can type in your location. It takes you straight to where you are and tells you what the soil type is. Uh, so we need to kind of establish a, a national database that, you know, has persons being able to access that information. Now, on a more institutional level, if persons reach out to myself, etc., say, well, okay, I'm living here, what is the soil type, you know, we can give that information to them. Yeah, so there's a map that tells you exactly which soil series occurs where, and there's also some books that accompany those maps that tells you the properties of these soils. So it, it is not very extensive because it was done in the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s. It was called the Land Capability Study of the, well, of Trinidad and Tobago, but also done for the Caribbean islands. And it was, at that time, because of the nature of our economy then, it was done with an agricultural focus. So a lot of the properties that you would find in there would be more useful for agriculture. There has been some efforts on a local level to update that in terms of providing physical and engineering properties of soils for the same soil series that persons could, could access, but it has not been completed for all the soils in Trinidad. And there are little patches of studies that you can find at the UE library and maybe in different publications that other academics would have done. And I have to admit that much of the publications are academic in nature. We need to find a way to translate that into usable, practical, you know, interventions that people could, could jump on. And while I'm on that, I should also say, Trinidad has a land susceptibility, a landslide susceptibility map with the ODPM. They also have a flood susceptibility map with the ODPM as well, both of which 
we would have contributed to in terms of its development. I think it started in 2012. So we know, I would say we know where these issues are expected to happen. We know where you will find issues with flooding. We know where you will find issues with landslides. The key thing now is to put things in place to address those issues. Yeah. But with regard to that, though, and this is this is fabulous information to me because I'd be like, really? It have that? That's there? That's that's possible? And even I would, you answered the question I was going to ask because you spoke about the 70s more for the initial set of information, but in terms of flood susceptibility and landslide susceptibility, that was more 2012, so that's a little more recent. How do you go about those samples, though? Is it getting core? Is it coring samples? Uh, what, what was the process of getting those samples? So which one? It, it. Break it down from a read and spell, Dr. Rupnarek. <laughs> so for soils, you have to do a whole, like a soil survey is a very, very complicated process. I am, even up to this day, I'm so amazed that these people were able to do that with relatively good accuracy in the 70s without fancy GPS and things that like we have now. Yeah. So they would have completed a survey with grids, et cetera, and would have been able to uh, identify you know, the delineation between different soil series, and then they will take samples. And in soils, you have things like diagnostic horizons and so on, that once you see it, it could tell you, well, you know, this soil belongs to this particular series, etc. Yeah. So for soils, that's what they do. And in modern, in modern soil mapping, we use digital techniques now. So you could basically use what we call legacy data, things like climate, uh, uh, rainfall, like rainfall parameters, uh, vegetation, land use, etc., on parent material, depending on the type of the rock. And you could create a model that tells you where the most appropriate places to sample to give you the variability, well, to capture the variability that you would expect across the country. So that's for soils. And that's, as I said, it's a complicated process. It's, it takes a lot of resources and investment to do that properly. So as I say, I was very impressed with what would have happened in the 70s because we will need to go back in the field ever so often and look for soil. And 90% of the time, those old maps that before they were even digitized, that you could stick up on a wall, right? You could follow that. And when you go and it says that soil series occurs here, 99.9% .9 of the time, the soil that you find follows the properties that you expect it to follow. Yeah? So that was amazing in my mind. In terms of landslides and flooding, what you do is you create models. You look at the causation factors. So for landslide, it would be like slope, rainfall as a triggering factor, vegetation, soil type, etc. And you basically try to see which areas are more susceptible based on the causation factors. So you can have a landslide, a soil that is very susceptible to landslide because it's a, let's just say it's a clay. And I don't want to complicate the situation, but to make it simple, right? A clay is something that has very low friction angle. Friction angle means that when the soil has to shear or move, it moves very easily. And I think you could understand that in theory because it, it's smooth, right? So yeah, it will, yeah, me thinking about angle of repose and all these kind of things too. But yeah, very similar to that. But friction angle is the internal angle, right? So when you try to shear it or move it, it a clay is smooth, right? So it will move very easily. Whereas sandy soils, they will have more resistance because of the nature of the particles, right? More friction. So a clay could be occurring on flat land, but if you consider soil alone as a property for landslides, it is not very susceptible because it's on a flat piece of land. Yeah? So you have to merge all these factors together and then find the areas that have all these causation factors contributing the most to, to a particular outcome. So that's what we would have done for the landslides. Similarly, with floods, you look at the causation factors. Low elevation is the opposite of landslides in a sense. So flat areas, uh, rainfall, uh, drainage, density, and that sort of thing. You combine all of those factors and you say, well, okay, you have to rank them. So flat land will be ranked higher than, than slow flat, steep slopes, right? Uh, more rainfall will be ranked higher than less rainfall, yeah? And you, you continue that. And when you rank that and place it into a model, the, the one that gives you the, 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 the largest output tells you that, okay, all these areas that have these values, they are more susceptible to flooding than these other areas, yeah? But that being said, 
I don't want to I oversimplify in this because not all factors contribute the same. You follow what I mean? So they can't be equally weighted in a model. And in terms of equally looking at those factors and 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 weighting, weighting them in the hierarchy that you that you would choose, uh, how often do you need to update those models? Because factors will change. There will be there may be less vegetation. There may be more building in a in a spot. Uh, what are some of those things that you look at that determine how often you need to update or amend models? Well. I can't really answer that with any degree of certainty because to do these things take a fair amount of time. Yeah. And it's really based on, you know, because we now started in the whole realm of disaster risk resilience. And I say no, because this only really became a focus in, in the Caribbean at a, a level where people started to have disaster risk management policies, etc. maybe in 2010. Yeah. Before that, it was, superficial in a way. Now you're seeing these things started to be, you know, incorporated into policy. You have things like the Sendai framework, which speaks to disastrous resilience that we are signatory to. And then the Agenda 2030, all of these things kind of push us in the direction of ensuring that we have policies to do that. Many times these things are done by research institutions like UE, for instance, with, you know, a PhD student or something. And it doesn't always get to the agencies that need it in ways that they, they need it. But I am seeing a change in that because most agencies are now partnering with academics to try to work on these things. And I will say these models should be updated every five years, I would say, because the rate of which is, is functional because it depends on the rate of development and the rate of change. And as you can see, the rate of change is significant in the last couple of years. In, in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, Dr. Ropenang, this is the time that we have for the conversation at this juncture. I will ask you to hold on for five minutes more. So if you are looking at this conversation on our digital platforms, you'll see the entire, you'll see it in its entirety. But if you're looking at us on television, thank you very much, Dr. Ropenang. And on behalf of the TTT News team, I'm DK Roster. This has been In Depth. Thank you so much for joining us. So if you are still seeing us, that means you're looking at us on a digital platform. Thank you so much. And Dr. Rupnarain, Dr. Ronald Rupnarain, you were you just talking about the need because the rate of development should mean that the research into different factors should be ongoing, possibly at an even increased pace. Speak to an individual who is wondering if, I wonder if this soil science thing makes sense for me, boy. What are some of the applications? What are some of the implications? And I say that because after everything is said and done, someone wants to go and be able to look after themselves financially to a certain sort of level after going to good school and getting the piece of paper. So what would you suggest to an individual in terms of those practical applications and the way that we can use them? Well, let me, let me tell you it very simply. For me, I got into soil science because I realized at the time there were only two people who, do, who did that in the entire region. Yeah? And it was a very practical decision after looking at it and thinking what career path should... This is after your undergraduate degree, right? Because to really become a, a soil scientist, you would at least need a master's or get to a PhD level, yeah? So, but I have colleagues who are medical doctors and they give me talks sometimes, you're a doctor of soil, da, 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 da. and I say very simply, there is more soil than people. Think about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of opportunities and career paths, as I say, the, 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 there's no soil science degree or anything like that you could do. The only time you could become a soil scientist is if you do an MPhil or a PhD in soil science, at least locally, right? Or regionally, I should say. So that's the, the way that you have to look at it. And of course, there's the academic route. There's also, you know, in soil science, you could help from agriculture to environment to even construction, because I think as I mentioned before, there is a need for soil science to be integrated into civil engineering in a more, you know, uh, in-depth way. 
so that we study these things properly and we could give because they do geo geotechnical studies, right? Which is before you do a construction, you will have to do boreholes, etc. But clay, for instance, when a man say it's a clay soil here, there are so many different types of clays. The percentage clay in a clay soil is very variable as well. So a soil could be considered a clay if it has about 40% clay present in it. But that could go from 40% to 90%. Yeah? And it could still be considered a clay. And on top of that, different clays have different minerals. So you have what we call expansive minerals, as I mentioned before. Those are, in, 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 in simplistic terms, what that means is these soils, they absorb water in the rainy season or when water is available, so they swell, right? And in the dry season, they lose water, so they shrink. So just imagine having a road or a building or something on top soil that have that property. Technically speaking, during repeated cycles of wetting and drying, you would be going up and down, up and down. Hence the reason for the cracks and so on and seeing in the road, yeah? And... So yeah, that's another way. And then from agriculture, it's also very important to understand your soils. You need to understand, you know, I I have like, in terms of irrigation, you need to know how much water to add, when to add the water. You know, um, we do really practice irrigation agriculture to a large scale in the region in general, because most of our agriculture is rain fed. But if we get to a point where there is water scarcity, if we want to beef up agriculture, etc., we need to get into irrigation. We need to look at things like water as a resource and not something that, you know, you could just use as you, you know, you know what I mean, right? So we, we don't really have that attitude here per se. So we use water however we want, most most of the times, yeah? And it's, it's possible that there will come a time where scarcity drives us to say, we need to do these things more efficiently. Yeah, so somebody using irrigation to water a cropland. They could very well be over irrigating. They could be adding too much water because I asked, I asked some persons who involved, how do you decide when to stop irrigating? They say, well, this is in our class. They'd be like, so, well, you know, when you saw it wet, you're it looking wet. And it's a visual thing rather than a scientific thing where you understand, a soil could very well be looking wet, you know, but the water may not be penetrating to the bottom layers. It could be in, um, it could have different types, like a soil could have, Clay at the top, sand in the middle, etc. It doesn't have to be uniform. So what you're seeing at the top is not necessarily a reflection of what is going on below. So my perspective on this is there are lots of opportunities for persons interested in soils. And when you see the Safe Soil Movement and you know, um, Satguru, uh, Marshall Montano had provided some much needed awareness to this particular issue in terms of organic matter and how it helps with soil structure and so on and so forth. So we, we, we couldn't have got this if we just we if we just operated within the confines of the original 20 minutes. So I want to thank you so much for that. And you're talking, Dr. Rupna Ryan, and I see so many other applications. So in terms of like somebody going in for a permit to build, and part of that being okay, well, you need to know exactly what you're dealing with. So you're able to um pick the access some of the, the studies that were done before to give you a better idea of how it is you're dealing with that. We may not be there yet, but I, hopefully this is something that becomes what it is we're doing. But I really want to thank you for the work that you're doing and hopefully we're able to have further conversations because these are things that need telling and we haven't really even spoke about risk mitigation too much. But hopefully that's something that we do the next time, Dr. Ronald Rupnarine. And if you're here with us on this digital platform, thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you so much for joining us.